to TW Retro. Here on my table there is a C64 board again and I think we'll start right away. It's an SA250425 and it absolutely brings nothing on the screen. The first thing we'll do is check the individual voltages on the board. To do this we take a multimeter and measure the corresponding voltages. So the problem is not because of the voltages, because they are all there. One step further. First of all we look at the reset signal. The signal is at the CPU. In this case we have an 6510 and it's on pin 40. If you look at the notch on the chips you will find pin 1 on the left upper side. And if you go through all the pins, the pin exactly on the upper side is pin 40. And we have to look at this signal first. We switch the computer on. After a short time it goes up exactly where it should be. And it stays there. So this is perfect. So we know the reset signal works and the problem must be somewhere else. The next check is whether the wick also gets its clock signals. These are on pins 21 and 22. And yes, and now we have a little problem. I can't get to the wick. That means I first have to desolder the cover away from here. The wick is the video chip of the C64 and if this doesn't get a signal or does not have the right frequency, then it will of course not show anything on the display. A slightly modified set D915 is used here. I put in a slightly larger fan, a step down controller and a few other things. And with that modifications it actually works pretty good. Oh nice. When I was desoldering I found this. Someone actually swapped out some RAM memories. And well, for things like that I always have some cleaning pads and a little bit of isopropanol. So let's remove the leftover flux here. We switch on the computer again and then we have a look at the point 21 to see what signal is coming out. Seventeen dot seven megahertz, it should be seventeen dot seven three, that's great. And at pin twenty two there should be seven dot eighty eight megahertz. Yeah, looks clean. So the problem is definitely not at the wick. Next let's take a look at the fifth pin of the CPU. That signal also looks clean too. So next I'll take a look at RAS and CAS of the wick. There is a wonderful signal. When I measure at RAS at the RAM memory, there is a wonderful signal. But when I measure the CAS now, then it's absolutely cheesy. So the next thing I think is that I have to look at the PLA. And this signal goes to the RAM memory and it looks absolutely the same. Yeah, stupid thing. 
I think we can't avoid a bit of theory now. A single bit of one of these DRAM memories is effectively a transistor, which can be seen as a switch and a capacitor. If the capacitor is charged, we have a 1. If the capacitor is empty, we have a 0. A single RAM memory, like one of these, from the older C64 boards has 8 kilobytes of memory. The term kilo stands for 1000, so for example if we take a kilometer, then it's also 1000 meters. Accordingly, 8 kilobytes also stands for 8000 bytes and 1 byte corresponds to 8 bits. So if you want to convert the 8000 bytes into bits, you calculate 8000 times 1 byte or 8000 times 8 bit. And that means that such a small memory has 64,000 bits of storage capacity. In other words, this little memory here contains 64,000 memory cells, each with a capacitor and a transistor. And now we are just talking about one single RAM memory here. Now of course it doesn't make sense to put a separate line into each of these 64,000 memory cells. So in this case we would have 64,000 lines that we would have to address individually. Accordingly, the memory cells were just mapped into a matrix. For example, like in Excel, you have rows and columns. And at each of these positions we have a memory cell. At each of these 8 RAM memories we would still have over 500 connections that we would have to control individually from the outside. To say it simple, however, you can say that the RAM memory contains additional controls which then can address and evaluate the individual memory cells. And these controls both have to be addressed so that the RAM memory at the respective memory cell in the respective column and row of the storage arrays can be written and read. I don't want to go into details much more, otherwise the video will get too long. But there is an absolutely brilliant video in English which I will link you in the description below. Should one of these two controllers, either the one for the row or the one for the column, not get any signal, then of course we get no information from the RAM chip. So, these two controls are called the row and column address buffers. Effectively, very few lines go from the outside to the address buffers and then many lines from the address buffers to the individual memory cells. Let's take a quick look at the RAM memory pinout. Here you can see a line over CAS. CAS means column address drop. And the column address buffer only becomes active as soon as it's low or zero. Let's go back to the oscilloscope. Normally these two signals to the two buffers should look the same and only shifted a bit in phase, so in time. The input here at the RAM is always high. And the RAM reacts like a human, so if he's always high, at some point he can no longer read or write. Now without fun, the column address buffer is only activated when it's not high, so when it's low. And well, after it is constantly high, it can't do absolutely anything. Where is this all coming from? We have already measured the wick. It gives out a clean signal. The RAM memory, on the other hand, does not receive a signal. And what's between? Now first we can have a look if any of the tracks of the board is burned through. Mm, well, no, that's not the case. Variant 2 is that the RAM memory is defective. In other words, one of the RAM memories keeps CAS permanently high. I don't think that's the case here, but after all RAM memories are socketed here on this board, we just can quickly remove them all. I now measure point 4 where the RAM memory was. Beautiful. And now let's measure point 15. And also, it's just high, so the PLA must definitely be damaged somewhere. That means next the PLA is actually changed. Everything that has been unsoldered should be provided with a socket directly. 
In the case the chip breaks again, you only have to put it out and put a new one in again. So we solder in a new socket. For the sake of health, I am now using a fume tractor. This is a solder suction device that sucks in the solder fumes and I don't need to breathe it in. Now the RAM memory has to be reinstalled. It is essential to be careful that you put it in the correct way. Otherwise you will end up with a short circuit and you have to look for further errors. Now we place a so-called plankton in the socket that we just soldered in. This is a PLA replacement that has been manufactured on the FPGA basis so that the newly soldered socket is not stretched directly by the plankton. I use a second socket under it. For testing this socket is absolutely enough and if we want to use an original PLA for that afterwards it also can be installed. After I reconnect the power and the monitor, all I have to say, switch it on. 38911 basic bytes free. Cool! Now all that's missing is a test with a check 64 and I think we have a working C64 again. So, in this case, you definitely assume that the C64 will work again. However, I don't yet know what I have to do with the PLA here. Unfortunately, I only have two planktons left and the planktons are not available anymore. But I'm definitely happy that the C64 is running again and I don't have to throw it away. If you like this video, please give a thumb up and maybe you will subscribe to my channel. There will be definitely be more of these repair videos. Then all I have to say is see you soon and goodbye. The interesting thing at the next measuring is if you switch it on, the next check, the next check is whether the wick gets its clock signals. To say it simple, however, you can say that the RAM memories contains additional controls which can be addressed and evaluate the individual me RAM me me memory and a capacitor. capacitor. And a capacitor. The input here at the RAM is just always high and the RAM.